We've all heard it before. Aluminium bikes are harsh and will rattle you to bits, and steel and titanium bikes are like gliding on a cloud. But is this actually true, or is it just a placebo? The more I studied bicycle comfort, the more I realised how small a role a frame plays in the overall comfort equation. Actually, my anecdotal experience goes against all conventional wisdom. The most uncomfortable bike I've ever swung a leg over was made out of steel. But as you'll find out today, it was not because of the frame material. Before we get too deep into this topic, I am not suggesting there is no difference in ride feel or quality between bikes made of different frame materials. This video is specifically focused on ride comfort. When it comes to the perceived comfort of one bike over another, there is one important measurement we can take, vertical compliance. This is the vertical distance your body moves in response to inputs from the road or trail. A bike with a greater vertical compliance can provide a nice buffer from imperfections in the road. But how much vertical compliance does a frame actually have? It turns out there is virtually no difference in the amount of vertical compliance between bicycle frames. This actually makes sense because a diamond bicycle frame is a simple truss structure and this shape inherently likes to resist loads in a vertical plane. In other words, your frame sucks at flexing. There are very few tests that have measured the vertical deflection or comfort of a bicycle frame by itself. That's because experiments are almost always conducted using a seat post inserted into a frame. We don't attach our seats directly to our top tubes after all. In the 1990s, Bob Bundy did some deflection tests on four 80s road frames. These frames required between 7,000 and 14,000 newtons of force to flex the rear triangle just one vertical millimeter. Let me put those numbers into context for you. A carbon flex seat post will deflect that same distance with 69 newtons of force. That's literally 100 to 200 times less force. These days, the best frame deflection testing we have is by Tour magazine in Germany. They've tested the vertical deflection of more than 100 different road bikes. But importantly, these tests measure both the seat post and the frame. Interestingly, the vertical deflection numbers of a frame and seat post test by Tour magazine correlate almost exactly the same as the seat post only tests by Microback Laboratories. It then follows that if a seat post can flex that much by itself, then the frame must be playing a very minor role in the overall vertical deflection. I would not be surprised if the seat post accounted for 99% of the deflection, while the frame accounted for less than 1%. The microback numbers are likely a little bit lower because they were tested with the maximum exposed seat post amount, while the Tour magazine numbers were tested at roughly 23 centimetres of exposed seat post. With a shorter lever, you end up with more force required to flex the seat post the same distance vertically. Tire deformation is very complex because there are lots of variables that go into determining the distance a tire can displace. This includes features like the tire width, tire construction material, protection layers, sidewall thicknesses, tread patterns, rim width, and whether it's set up tubed or tubeless. Tires also deform differently depending on the surface they're interacting with. That's characteristics like the bump shape and the hardness of the surface. It gets even more complex because tires do not deform linearly like a seat post. That means each millimetre of deformation will technically require more force than the previous one. But let's not get stuck in the weeds here. The important point is that the force required to displace a tyre by one millimetre is very low. This table on the Silka blog shows just how much force is required to deform their test tyre on different surface geometries. The left column is on a perfectly flat surface, the middle column is after hitting a cobblestone, and the right column is after impacting a pavement lip. As you can see, less force is required to deform the tyre on sharper surfaces. On flat and cobblestone type surfaces, you'll find a flex seat post will actually deform more than a 23 to 28 millimetre tyre. But the tyre will offer the most vertical compliance when you get into the bigger widths. Okay, but what about the rear wheel? Well, we've studied the vertical deflection on wheels as well, and it turns out they don't have much of the stuff. According to the testing over at Killer's Garage, a load on a wheel results in between 0.002 
and 0.0075 inches deflection. We can convert these numbers to newtons per millimetre, which gives us a range of 891 and 1378 newtons per millimetre. In other words, you will require 13 to 20 times more force to move a wheel of vertical millimetre than you do a flex carbon seat post. OK, we now need to compare the deflection of all components together by calculating out the rate of springs in a series. Many components on a bicycle offer some vertical deflection, as microscopic as it may be, making them all effectively springs. The system from the ground up is made of springs in this order. The tyre, rim, nipples, spokes, hub shell, bearings, axle, frame, seat post and saddle. By calculating the rate of springs in a series, we can understand how these parts all work together to provide vertical deflection. Interestingly, when we add up the springs in a series together, the result is a spring rate that is less than that of the softer spring, which is usually the tyre, but it can be the seat post if your bike has narrow, high-pressure tyres. It therefore follows that if you can add a particularly fat tyre or carbon flex seat post to your bike, you are guaranteed a ride that is comfortable, no matter the frame material. In the following table, you'll see the calculated spring rates for a few different flex seat post and tyre combinations. This table shows just how much the softer spring dominates. Even with high pressure road tyres, the spring in a series effect of the flex seat posts results in very little force required to displace your body a vertical millimetre. As you can see, the flex seat posts play a minor role in the spring rate of a bike with wide tyres. Flex seat posts will therefore give you the most benefit on a road bike. The spring in a series calculations also help us to understand how components that require a particularly high force to deflect a vertical millimetre are essentially meaningless. What about vibrations? Don't frame materials dampen vibrations to varying degrees? By simply tapping on a metal frame, you'll find it rings, as it has rather low damping properties. In comparison, when you tap a carbon frame, it makes a dull thump sound. This is because carbon fibre inherently has more damping than metals do. More damping equals better vibration attenuation. That said, we need to remember that a bike frame is part of a larger system. Softer components on your bike, such as your rubber tyres, the padding of your saddle, and the contents of your luggage are all much more highly damped than your frame. Therefore, the wider your tyres, the thicker your saddle padding, or the more soft luggage you strap to your bike, the smoother your bike will feel. Assuming I'm carrying no luggage, I've noticed almost zero damping difference between carbon and metal bikes once my tyres are over about 40 millimetres in width. But on my bikes with narrower tyres, I've always preferred the way carbon kills the road buzz. And with luggage attached to any bike, I find them all to ride incredibly smooth. If you swear black and blue that you can still notice the extra comfort in a steel or titanium frame, well, I'm afraid that all data suggests it's just a placebo. But if you genuinely believe that, well, I'm jealous. When we consider all components that move in a vertical plane, your frame material, be it steel, aluminium, titanium or carbon, will not affect your ride comfort. Not only is frame compliance a small proportion of the overall spring rate, but it also becomes completely insignificant when we calculate out the springs in a series. The most important components for optimising the comfort on your bike are your tyres, which will deform at a rate of 10 to 250 newtons per millimetre, and your seat post, which can deform as low as 69 newtons per millimetre. Oh, and by the way, that uncomfortable steel bike I once rode? Well, it was running narrow 22mm tyres, had almost no exposed seat post, and was equipped with a very firm racing saddle. Hopefully, it now makes sense to you why some steel bikes will rattle you to bits and other aluminium bikes will ride like you're gliding on a cloud. Hey, if you're stoked on this insane bike nerd content, I'd love to see your support over on Patreon. I hate asking for assistance, but I've literally put hundreds of hours into research and production on this video, so it'd be really cool to justify my time to make more.